Welcome back to In Conversation with our special guest, Admiral Eric Olson, former commander of the U.S. Special Operations Command. Admiral, your address to the Distinguished Speaker Series audience uh, recently was the world at night. Uh, it's a very provocative image, and it's a, the slide that you showed is very powerful. Tell us about what that means. Yeah, thanks, Art. I don't mean for it to be a, a double entendre. It's not about conducting operating, you know, night operations. It's, uh, it's really drawn from a photograph that struck me as I was struggling to, um, to, to understand how our strategic interests had shifted since 9-1-1. And, and when I saw this composite photograph uh, provided by NASA of the Earth uh, taken at night, uh, shows where the lights are and where the lights aren't, it struck me that our Cold War strategic thinking was that the important places on Earth are where the lights are, that people live there, societies are developed there, goods are produced there, people and things move east and west across that relatively narrow band of the, of the mid-northern hemisphere. Think of our friends there, think NATO, think of our adversaries, potential adversaries there, think Soviet Union and communist China. Uh, but 9 struck us dramatically, uh, causing us to shift our gaze a bit to the south, uh, to a band in the, below the, the band of bright lights, uh, to where societies aren't as developed and borders are more porous and airports are less secure and open areas are less governed uh, where training camps can, can develop, where societal conditions may contribute to the recruitment of, of people to terrorist or terrorist-related activities. And, and if you look back at the, at the attempted strikes on the United States since 9-1-1, just the ones we know about, the Times Square bomber and the Detroit underwear bomber and the Portland teenager and the ink toner, those are traceable back to the places where the lights aren't. And, uh, and we found ourselves in many ways unprepared to, to deal with those places because we simply didn't under have the depth of understanding. We didn't historically have military to military relations with them. Uh, we were pretty good at speaking Spanish, French, and Russian, but we weren't good at all at speaking Dari, Pashtu, Urdu, or Igbo. And, uh, and so, this, is, this, this world at night is really alluding to shifting our gaze to the south uh, to, where the, to where the lights aren't. And special operations forces have a particular role to play in this new world. They do. Special operations forces are regionally oriented. oriented. They are out um, in terms of being global scouts, if you will, every day, uh, conducting some sort of an activity not missions, not operations, but some sort of activity, most often a training activity, uh, with counterparts in about 70 countries uh, on any given day. Uh, so they are out there. Uh, but we, we found ourselves, even within the special operations community, underprepared sure. to really understand the nuances of these places, the effects of these places, the effects of terrain and climate and religion and family histories and tribal relationships and all of that that are more and more important to developing the right military strategies. Uh, when you are engaged in potentially in what uh, a retired British general Rupert Smith calls war amongst the people, uh, it's an entirely different set of factors that you have to consider as compared to facing a column of tanks or a fighter jet in air-to-air -air combat. And when we do a drone attack uh, after a, a terrorist target and hit collateral damage, as it's called, uh, we could be creating new terrorists with the families and friends of those who were accidentally hit. It's, Im it's important to be able to accurately predict the effects of your behavior yeah. and then have a plan to deal with the negative aspects of that. One of the problems, of course, is no return address for some of these groups. They do something bad to us and where do you go? Uh, you know, there's no one place where you can focus. And then secondly, it seems with the new technology, uh, increasingly lethal bombs and weapons can be in increasingly small packages. And so you have a double whammy. The, uh, the, 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 the enemy is less obvious now. Uh, not wearing a uniform, not in formation, not under an identifiable command and control relationships, often operating as a surrogate or a 
almost a franchisee, uh, a subscriber to an ideology. Uh, and so from that standpoint, it's also important to, to gain the operational context of a place. It just struck me, our Revolutionary War, the British marched in with red coats and all of the majesty and all that, and we took them down. From, we, we, from were the, the, we were the insurgents. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I know that uh, you're now uh, uh, teaching as an adjunct professor at Columbia. I am. And it struck me that, that, in a sense, you've been teaching all through your career. You've been training these troops, you've been motivating them, and, and now you're doing, uh, now you're teaching just in a different context. Yeah, I, I, I haven't uh, really thought of myself as a teacher through my military career, although I know there are some aspects of teaching that come into, into being a commander of a, a unit. Um, but what I'm trying to do now really is share some of my experience and, and draw from the, the students. Ideally, I will get much more from it than they do. They, that's what uh, they say. <laughs> uh, and and I'm, I'm uh, really enjoying my, my yeah. academic experience. Uh, let's go back to the, the kinds of missions that you and other SEALs have, have done. The bravery, uh, facing, facing death as you go into a mission and not blinking. Uh, there's fear, but you have to learn how to control the fear, I guess. Just, just speak to a couple of the missions that you're familiar with and, and how people react to the dangers embodied in these missions. Yeah, I won't, uh, I won't go into any specific missions or or events, I will tell you that uh, that there is a high level of courage, a high expectation of courage, and, and I think an overriding emotion is to not let one's teammates down. Um, most of our highest awards have been granted not for attacking the enemy, but for saving our own. Really? And uh, the acts of raw bravery, of extraordinary courage that that one sees in a, in a real firefight, people giving up positions of relative security to rush into a hail of fire to pull a wounded teammate back to safety. It's, uh, it's just amazing to see that. Some of it in the special operations community certainly comes from the tight bonding. I mean, the fact that people know each other well, train uh, with each other for long periods of time and, and almost become a family. And there's a culture of, uh, there's a culture that is created in this family, and, and it has to do with values and teamwork, and uh, just just speak a little bit to the SEAL culture. It's, uh, it's interesting that a few years ago, some of the SEALs, the, the more junior to mid-level operators, wanted to sequester themselves and craft their own ethos document to send up the chain of command. And uh, as a commander, I gotta tell you that it's exactly the kind of document that any boss would hope to, to hear from the, uh, from the ground floor. And it talks about pride, about honor, about humility, about never quitting, about persevering through, uh, through any, uh, past any obstacle, uh, and about ultimately about mission success. Um, so that, that is part of the culture. And then, as I said, this was not a shiny document passed down to the troops. This was what they crafted themselves, and it's very powerful. It just struck me that, you know, a lot of organizations have codes of conduct and codes of honor and all that stuff, but you guys really walk the walk. I mean, you live this and you practice it, and even though you, you deal with tragedy and deaths and losses, in a sense it must be quite uplifting to see a group of people that embody a culture of values that are so strong and so positive and so right. Just an amazing community and, and so pleased that, that my career gave me the opportunity to be part of it. Uh, 38 years in the military and uh, uh, first, thank you so much for your service to the country thank you, and, yeah. uh, and thank you for, for visiting our campus and, and this show. In the two or three minutes we have left, I. I just like uh, folks to get a, a sense of you as a person. You, you were the first military in your family. You were explaining was, to me, yeah, and you yeah. went to the academy, and you were struck by something turned you on about seals. Why did you want to become a seal? 
Yeah, that's, uh, I don't mean to make it more complex than it is, but I did go to the Naval Academy at a time of uh, at the height of the Vietnam War protest. And, and in fact, I had attended a war protest within sight of the Capitol and was proud that we lived in a country that permitted that sort of activity. And I was inspired to serve in, in some way. I found my way to the, uh, to the Naval Academy, but uh, I have to say that, uh, that while there, I, 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 I learned about myself that I didn't really want the, the classic traditional regimented military. I wanted to do something a little bit different within the uniformed service. And so I was attracted to CBs and explosive ordnance disposal and the underwater demolition team SEAL community and ultimately found my way. Uh, found my way into that as, uh, as, as one of a few members of my class who was fortunate to be selected for, for that career path. That is just wonderful. And I know uh, your reputation in the field. Uh, guests from San Diego and throughout the Southland came to visit and hear you at, uh, at the Distinguished Speaker Series uh, event. And, uh, uh, and you did it in the background. As you pointed out to me that you never did interviews while you were in command. You, you yeah. just did the job. No, I'm just coming out of that shell now. Uh, this is probably the most public uh, I've ever been, uh, but I'm I'm doing it because I think the the American people have some right to know what it is they've invested in in their special operations community. Uh, this isn't about marketing. This isn't about controversy or politics. This is simply about educating uh, in a way that uh, that I feel able to do from my experience. Uh, and, and talking about the, 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 the values, the balance of the special operations community. Well, Admiral, again, thank you for joining us. And through you, thank the thousands of men and women Absolutely. in your command and elsewhere that uh, uh, sacrifice so much to protect our country each and every day. Thank you so much. Good to be with you, Art. Okay. Thank you for joining us. And uh, uh, this is Art Levine. Uh, thanking you for being part of our In Conversation show and saying good night from the campus of California State University, Long Beach. Straight Talk has been brought to you by Southern California Edison, the Press Telegram, and remember, Straight Talk is viewable worldwide 24-7 at straighttalktv.com.